morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's Let's Talk Dairy webinar. It's a lovely day in the uh, County Cork, anyway. Hopefully, it's lovely where you are as well. Things might be beginning to turn a little bit, I think, hopefully. So, from a grass point of view, we should start to see some slightly better growth rates coming towards us, and hopefully, we'll be getting on to the normal run of events from second rotation on now at this stage. So, this week, uh, I'm going to do a little bit on the sex semen and also on the synchronization protocols. A couple of questions came up about it last week, um, and I'm going to deal with them this week. So, uh, I suppose there's a lot of talk about sex semen, um, more so this year than there has been in previous years. I suppose uh, people have started to dabble in it, I suppose, is the term you'd use in the last number of years. And um, with, with success, and there has been fairly successful trial work done as well with Stephen Butler in the last number of years as well. So like, the posit I suppose there's, there's positives coming from the trial work, obviously, but there's also points to note from the trial work also as well. So um, I'll just uh, share a few slides. And as I said, we'll talk about the synchronization protocols then as well, of which there are a couple. Um, and we can put in the the uh, questions there through the chat as we go along and properly deal with them as we go. Okay, so so um, I'll just skip down to the this last slide here now first in relation to the sex semen use. I suppose the most important thing is, uh, from my perspective anyway, is that there are two categories of people out there who are going to use sex, uh, sex, sex semen. Um, there are those who are going to use it successfully and there are those who are going to use it because they feel they need to use it and it be, won't be as successful. So herds that don't have good fertility already probably wouldn't be good candidates for it in that they're obviously not delivering in terms of fertility performance already. However, they are probably going to be the farms that wouldn't really need it more because they, they're not generating enough heifers uh, because their fertility isn't great in the first place or maybe they don't breed for long enough. Obviously, also, if you're not uh, inclined to do a lot of AI um, and heat detection isn't a strong point for you, it's probably not wise to, to go down the direction of sex semen um, because it's a little bit more of a fine-tuned art in relation to heat detection. So I suppose with heifers, uh, heifers are probably the most uh, suitable for it from the point of view that their fertility is going to be very good. Um, obviously, they don't have the challenges of milk production uh, that um, cows are going to have. But there are a few key points that are going to be important about for them. Obviously, they have to hit their target live weight. So we want heifers that are now in the region of, I suppose, in the black and white versions, um, 320, 330 kilos on average going into, into breeding in a couple of weeks time. Obviously, being good body condition, the two of those generally tend to go on hand, hand in hand. So if they have good live weight, they should have good body condition score as well. And then they need to be cycling regularly as well. And that's true of the synchronization protocols as well. They'll need to be cycling in, in many cases um, in order for those synchronization protocols to work. When it comes to cows, then I suppose the um, important thing is that you're looking to probably breed off the best. So that that's generally going to be the younger cows in the herd, obviously. Um, Cleaner cows as well, clean cows, so no problems in terms of no health issues. So anything that had a milk fever, a ketosis, a hard calving, um, a retained after birth, or any health issue, including mastitis potentially in the intervening period, uh, would be candidates not to be submitted for sex semen. They should be crossed off the list because they're going to have challenges. And sex semen is that little bit more vulnerable product relative to the normal. Uh, semen straws and as a result that means we probably need to focus to use them on healthier animals. Now there's two sides to that I suppose in the trials that Stephen has done there could be a slight bias um, towards the fact that the cows were generally healthy the ones that were used so that would mean that if you're not going to implement that, that kind of regime on your own farm and you're going to use sex semen across um, all the cows potentially are not be selective in the cows that you use, you could get poorer performance than you would um, have got seen on the trials. So Stephen's objective is we, we take it that there's relative a uh, conception rate of approximately 60% to first service with normal AI. Uh, and Stephen's objective is that we can we should be able to achieve what's known as the relative conception rate of 90%. So relative to the 60% for conventional, that we should be able to achieve 54% uh, 
for service consumption rate with six team. Now, we haven't fully achieved that on the trial work that has been done uh, uh, on an average across all the herds that were involved in the trials. However, it has been achieved uh, and, and greater than that has been achieved in some of the herds, in the, the top third of the herds that were involved in the trial. So I just got a question there in relation to parity one to four. So that's actually just the cows that are first calvers through to fourth calvers would be the objective to, to target the sex semen for rather than going for older cows. So cows that are into their fifth and sixth lactation wouldn't be being put forward for sex semen. Um, as I said, no health issues, uh, and that would mean that they should be cycling regularly then as well. Good body condition score and 50 days or more in milk at that stage. So and they're just after going, kind of hitting their peak or just gone beyond peak so that they're in a kind of a settled state as such when they are being bred so that there isn't as much pressure on the system uh, of the cow in terms of milk production and, and going in calf as well. So there are, I suppose, the key points around the sex semen. Um, the, the main thing, I suppose, is that people have to be uh, talking to their, their breeding, their AI technician and talking to their uh, breeding advisors and so forth and their own target advisors in relation to planning this, uh, it's not something that you just jump in and decide to do. Uh, you need to be organized, I suppose, as, as you can see there from the right hand side, you need to have cows nominated for this or identified that are going to be suitable. And then when you talk to um, like Dorian Cardin and Munster Bovine, uh, she, she would say that you need to be very flexible on the day as well. Um, so if you're going to, you need to be flexible in general as well as flexible on the day. So if you are, um, heat detecting for sex semen, you are looking at submitting cows that have come bowling evening before. So if your AI technician is coming this morning um, and cows were bowling freshly this morning, they should not get a sex semen straw this morning because they're too fresh. Uh, and because of the process uh, related to sex semen, the semen is just not viable for as long as conventional semen would be in the tract. Uh, and that means that we have less of a window of opportunity to deal with when it comes to actually serving and uh, having it coincide, the, the semen arriving in the tra or being in the tract at the time when the egg is released. Uh, so we have to be a little bit tighter with our, with our um, service regime. So that means the cow that was bowling last night would be suitable for sex semen this morning. Um, and as I suppose, for example, as I said, it's a lovely morning where I am here in Cork this morning. Um, so this, this morning would be a good morning to, to serve a cow probably, assuming that she was bowling last night because she isn't under any kind of extra pressure from the point of view of a wet night that has compromised intakes potentially or anything like that. So the, um, the key thing is that it's really the AMPM rule has been there before for, for uh, conventional semen, but there is a little bit of scope to get around that because of the fact that the conventional semen will remain viable for a long period of time. So it can be, you can see a cow bowling freshly enough this morning have the AI technician serve her around now or maybe later in the morning or whatever, and the semen would still be viable and able, capable of fertilization, uh, even though she's not going to have a lot later on in the day. However, that is not the case with the sex semen. So a cow seen bowling freshly this morning, if you, want, if you really want to use sex semen, will have to be served this evening rather than this morning or else you make the decision that you serve a conventional AI if you're only on a once a day AI service. Um, then I suppose the, the other thing is that, uh, you need, as I said, you need to be flexible around the whole element of the, the nutrition of the cow on, on a given day. So like if there's very bad weather and as I said, compromising uh, intakes, then the advice is probably not to be uh, when they're using sex semen in those scenarios, because again, it's probably going to undermine the animal. Now, if you can maintain the intake, obviously throughout the, the, the kind of dip in, in weather. So I suppose what, what, like obviously we're going to get fluctuations in intake on a on a day-to-day -day basis, depending on the weather. But I suppose what, what Doreen is, is quite adamant about is that if you're seeing a consistent um, downward pressure on intakes and performance of the cow. So if, is your milk protein dropping on your text message that you're getting for a number of days? Um, is your milk yield dropping in terms of what's being collected on uh, every second day by the bull tank? If that's the case, then sex semen isn't going to be appropriate to use because you're on a downward plane in nutrition and you need, uh, and that well looked there's probably a certain element of that going to impact on conventional semen also, if that's the case, because that means that there's 
severe nutritional uh, consequences for the herd as a result of the management that's happening or as a result of the weather. So you need to adjust that. So you need your milk to be at, at the very minimum static in the boil tank and uh, possibly rising. And you need protein levels to be staying consistent because that's a good ind indicator of energy intake. Uh, and if the energy intake is dropping, obviously, uh, you're going to compromise um, the animal in terms of their reproductive performance. So just to be clear on that, I suppose, um, we want to select the cows in advance. They need to be calved a good while, so you'd be looking that they have maybe two or three cycles already under them so that they're hitting maybe the third or fourth cycle by the time they're, they're being served with sex semen. That means that they're going to be very clean, uh, and it'll, they should also be clean because they should have had no health issues in terms of their milk fevers, their ketosis, their mastitis, as I said as well. So you need good records in a lot of cases for these. So any cow that got mastitis, in the last couple of weeks since they calved, not necessarily at the point of calving, again, would be, a can, would be ruled out for, for sex semen in the current uh, protocols that we have there. So, uh, and the heifers, as I said, they, uh, they offer a prime opportunity and I suppose the synchronization of both heifers and cows for people that want to use AI is something that Stephen is, is er, sorry, want to use sex semen AI, uh, is something that Stephen is very strong on point being there that we can do this very early on in the breeding season. There is going to be a slightly lesser conception rate, uh, as I've already outlined, in relation to sex semen versus conventional semen. So the fact that we've done early in the season will allow uh, people to get us another dairy straw potentially into those cows um, within the kind of the three to four week window. Uh, and it means it, that there isn't a big impact on six week calving rate potentially and the numbers are relatively small in terms of the, the numbers that are going to slip at the start if they don't go and calf. So it won't have a big impact on farm performance overall in terms of six week calving rate. And obviously we know that that underpins profitability as well. So the key things I suppose are, are to have them in right order, regularly cycling, proper weight and good condition. And as I said, with the cows, no health issues. So then, as I said, synchronization is the key. I suppose there's a couple of synchronization processes there. Just go back to the start here. <clears throat> so the normal one that we've been recommending for a good number of years with the um, with the heifers in particular uh, would be that the prostaglandin, so observed heat for seven days and then coming in with your um, prostaglandin injection at seven days and AIing then after that. So everything should be generally coming in about 48 to 72 hours after this injection here that hasn't been already seen. There'll be a few then just because of the way the hormones work in the animal system that won't respond to that injection just because they're outside of the window where they haven't shown here for heat, but they, they won't respond to that injection on day seven. So they may need to be injected subsequently. Now, a lot of people probably tend to serve for the seven days, inject, serve whatever comes bullying then and release them after that and whatever is not served is left off with a bull. Um, but we would say that you probably want to be maximizing genetic gain in terms of trying to get dairy straws into all efforts so that you would probably um, inject again anything that hadn't been served and get a, at least a dairy straw into them before they're released with the with the um, bull, with bulls. Then I suppose the uh, like you can you obviously need heat detection aids and belt and braces approach is being using the likes of scratch cards and uh, crayons as well. Tail paint doesn't work as well in heifers because of the fact that they are probably not heavy enough. So as I said, 320, 330 kilos, the level of friction between them as they mount uh, and the, the distance that they travel up on the rump of the animal that's bulling isn't as significant as it would be in cows. So the tendency for to rub off tail paint isn't as, as good with, um, with tail paint. So, the heifers would be recommended that you would use scratch cards and crayons, potentially. Crayons are very similar to the tail paint, but it works, it comes off a lot easier. Uh, and the scratch cards kind of give an idea as well in terms of uh, heat performance, not as, a, in, in, as in progression of heat and how far along through the, the heat they are. So they're slightly scratched, they're, they're maybe just coming in. Whereas if they, they're like your, your scratch card that you buy from the National Lottery, if they're fully rubbed after they have been in heat and they're due to be served. Uh, and we can't recommend enough people using those, but with the, with the likes of the, and KMRs are something that people use as well. Now, some people find that they get false positives with those. 
Um, they try to build in uh, kind of a color changes in them gradually as well, sim similar to the way the scratch card coating comes off uh, to show the stage of the heat there. But um, again, it depends on what works for you, I suppose, but it's important that you are using heat detection aids because it's very difficult, especially with heifers, um, uh, to pick them up without the use of heat detection aids. So the, the lambing short of this is, I suppose, that you're getting most of your heifers bred by day 10, as you can see here. Uh, it's taken about three weeks, obviously, to take for the whole thing to take place if you go the full distance in terms of following through with your second AI. Uh, so that may not work for everybody from the point of view of some people may have heifers on the, on the milking platform uh, just for to breed them and they want to get them off as quick as possible. Uh, so they may want to use a more fixed time AI protocol that can really synchronize and, and compact the, the breeding of the heifers so that they can be moved away quickly. I suppose just to point out as well before I move on to the onto the fixed time AI protocols is the that PG there is is referring to prostaglandin and there's uh, many trade names out there for those but the ones that uh, are most popular probably would be estimate in particular lutealase them would be the next one probably that you hear about most and enzoprost as well um, and there are other derivatives out, of it out there but make sure I suppose discuss with your vet when you're getting it that uh, let's say that they're Going to, that you're going to use the right rate. Um, like anything, you need to read the labels of these. Some of these can have different dose rates. Estimate is generally two mil, um, but some of the other ones may need to, to be given at higher levels. So make sure that you give it at the correct dosage. So just moving on to the, um, the fixed time AI protocols. Uh, these are more expensive. Obviously, the PG, you're only using uh, a PG shot on some of the heifers uh, and some of them are getting a double shot if you're sticking with the program for longer. I just need to move this out of the way. Yeah, sorry. Um, so to, what they do is they promote cyclicity in heifers that are not cycling yet, uh, which is different to the PG. PG won't work if uh, heifers aren't already cycling. Uh, you would prefer it that these animals will be close to the target body weight of that 330 kilos as I said for the black and white maybe around the tree, somewhere in the region of probably looking at 300 to 330 kilos uh, depending on the breed so from 300 for your crossbreds up to 330 for your, your black and whites. Uh, you're AIing at a fixed time regardless of signs of heat which is as I said the, the beauty of it from the point of view of people maybe who are breeding heifers on the milking platform and looking to move them off as quickly as possible and um, so they're not waiting for a long period of time in order to do that or alternatively i suppose you can um do this on an out farm and you're also not going to be coming and going to the out farm on an ongoing basis trying to watch heifers which is time consuming obviously and also uh, can be a bit hit and miss as well um so i suppose the gnrh is is to get them to really ovulate so you're kind of trying to get them to to sink their, their regime by doing what you're doing here. So a shot of GNRH goes in here, and that is either a receptal or ovarolin. And again, I suppose, make sure that you're using those at the right dose rates. The P4 device is referring to a cedar or a prid. So again, it doesn't really matter which you use here, whatever's, um, once they're applied correctly. I suppose there's a bit of a technique maybe in relation to the cedars and the prids as well, in terms of the strings that come out of them. Heifers tend to do a lot of messing around and playing with one another and they can pull at the, the string that comes from those uh, and could pull them out. So they need to be either cut up short or turned in such a way that they don't um, stick out to entice an animal to pull at them and, and withdraw them. So then we should have, computers responding for me now, there should be an injection coming up here. There we go, all right, it's all after happening out one together. I'll go through it slowly here. So this uh, then three days before uh, you're injecting with prostaglandin. So again, your estrimate or your lutealase or whatever, um, and it, you're given a second shot then the day after that again, uh, and then you're you giving a shot of GnRH again plus time di. And what that GnRH, as I said at the start, is is inducing the ovulation. You're serving at the same time, so the tract now has uh, semen in it and is also going to release the egg within a short period of time. Uh, so that they're going to meet at the same time. So this, uh, I suppose there are, there are other derivatives of this um, synchronization protocol out there, out there which have less interventions. So there's one, there's one less PG being uh, taken into account. But the disadvantage of it is that 
uh, you're going to have a scenario where you'll have 10 to 15 percent of the heifers uh, actually bulling prior to the day that you were planning to do the fixed time AI. Uh, so from my perspective, I, I think there isn't much in it. There's a cost associated with that second PG, which is increasing the cost of the overall program by maybe about a fiver, I think. But it doesn't, like the, you have four interventions, four runs through the crush here. But if you remove this and you end up bringing in heifers to, to serve the day before you were planning on doing it anyway, you still have four runs through the crush more or less. So I don't think there's a big saving from a labor point of view in that. Uh, so I think you're probably going to have higher conception rates or higher uh, in calf rates as a result of this because they're not trying to pick, you're not trying to catch the heifers that come bowling in advance of the day that you're going to do it. This is very, very tight in terms of the way it works. So you're giving your GNRH, which as I said, is releasing the follicle or serving the same day. So there are semen in tract to meet that follicle when, when they combine then. Obviously the chances of fertilization are quite high. Fertilization actually occurs in a lot of cases, um, or in 90% of cases, but obviously con conception doesn't always happen. Um, so very high uh, chances of conception are increasing the chances of conception by taking that extra step. And I know that Stephen is very, Stephen Butler is, is uh, very adamant that this is probably the regime that people should be using rather than taking the chance on, on that lesser, slightly cheaper, but potentially less effective protocol. So that's the, there are the two protocols for synchronizing the heifers. Uh, as I said, this allows you to synchronize an awful lot of heifers uh, in one, or serve a lot of heifers in a very short period of time. There's two elements to that then, I suppose. The people often get worried around the facilities that they're going to need in order to deal with this surge of calving that's going to happen. So we're say, for example, we're serving on the 24th of April. Uh, that's going to be 1st of February calving date. Uh, technically on a 283 day calving um, and that means that they're going to be calving 1st of February and people get worried that like I've served 20 heifers are they all going to calve on the 1st of February no they're not they're generally going to spread out over 10 days uh, if you're using six semen on those and they're having heifers obviously they're going to come a little bit earlier so they could come t up to 10 days early um, but that said there's still going to be maybe more uh, stock calving if this is your first time going down the fixed AI um, route, then you might be used to. So you need to make sure that you're going to be prepared when it comes to it and have facilities to handle those extra, we'll say, if you're used to calving a, a bunch of heifers over three weeks and now you're going to have that, that bunch of heifers calving within a week, then obviously it could put a little bit more pressure on facilities. There's uh, positives, I suppose, in terms of you get the heifers calved, which gives them longer lactation for their first lactation, obviously, which is a good thing because they produce more milk, but it also means that they have more days uh, to recover before they're expected to go on calf again. So generally heifers take a little bit longer to recover following calving relative to cows. Um, so that little bit of, of extra time that they get by having them calved at the very start of the breeding season or at the start of the calving season is a positive in terms of helping them to make sure that they stay in the herd. The other big advantage when I talked to Dan Crowley about it from a cell count point of view is that you get cow, heifers calved very early on, uh, they're not inclined to be moved into calving areas and calving boxes that are potentially getting contaminated by uh, older cows. And it does tend to help in terms of um, cell count management within the herd as well. Obviously then they move into, uh, into the cow cubicle area, we'll say, which is being maybe uh, dusted with lime twice a day. They're being going through the parlor, they're getting teeth sprayed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they're all, they're all that's happening as part of the milking process as opposed to maybe trying to run heifers through the parlor to teeth spread them to make sure that they don't have any cell count issues as they're calving down. So that's, um, that's the, the synchronization protocol for the heifers. I suppose then for the, the fixed time AI for the, the cows, you're looking at a situation of um, trying to kickstart them, I suppose, uh, in a lot of cases. And I think it's probably something that we need to think about a bit more. Um, the, there's definitely, we're really good at making a big burst uh, at trying to get submission rate good in the first six weeks or the first three weeks in particular. And then uh, we'll probably fall down on a number of aspects following uh, that, that period. So we're aiming for our 90% submitted um, and get a good conception rate from them. And like the national figures would suggest that we are doing quite well as in that six week calving rate is rising 
more year on year or generally is, is tending to rise year on year. Now it's still only at 60, uh, 65, 68 percent or so like that. So there's still plenty of room for improvement. But what's tending to happen is the cows that get calved, calved late tend to slip further because we don't follow through with them or follow up on them. So the synchronization protocol uh, increases the submission rate for those um, cows that have calved late because they actually do get submitted for service because they've been put on the program. Whereas the idea of waiting for them to come, uh, they may never come potentially. Um, so the, it's, it's a good idea to put cows on uh, a program. I think once they've hit that kind of 35 to 40 days, that they're, it's, it's suitable to put them on it. So it's, it will promote cyclicity. So like we've been talking about using once a day in the past as well. So that will, so that will um, increase the chances of a cow cycling and assuming that they've calved down cleanly and haven't had any issues like your ketosis or milk fevers or anything like that, they should actually come cycling within probably uh, anywhere between 10 and 20 days, probably post calving, especially if they go on a once a day. Uh, and so you could actually potentially let them show on that heat, but if you're going to milk them twice a day, if milking once a day isn't an option, maybe because it's cell count or whatever, you could um, put them on the synchronization protocol. And it works fairly similarly to the one that I've shown you for the heifers, except for the when the GNRH is being uh, administered here. Um, and again, you're serving regardless of signs of heat as well. So, it, it, and that's why I mean, that's what I mean by when it, it gives 100% submission rate. So you're serving them, they're being submitted for service irrespective of whether they show heat or not. So we're given our GNRH here again, uh, PGs being administered minus three and minus two days, a GNRH the day before service as opposed to with service, which is the case in the, or the evening before service, which is the case with the heifer AI, uh, and then serving then on, on, the, um, on the morning of, the, of day zero. So I suppose Stephen works on these minus numbers here because obviously he's using these presentations or these he presents these figures at, at different uh, for, in different fora. But I think it's very very important that people look at uh, some or talk to their vet and write out their program on a day of the week basis. So uh, down here in this area where we, where we deal with monster bovine, they, they write in the Dairy Gold Milk Matters magazine and and in other magazines and stuff and reading information and management notes that they have themselves and they work, they lay it out on a day, to, day by day basis. So what day is day minus 10? So is it a Monday or is it a Tuesday? What day is minus three supposed to happen? What day is minus two uh, and minus one, etc. And when are you serving then? And I suppose the key thing with these protocols and uh, again, talking to both vets and talking to Doreen, obviously in, in Munster as well, the challenge that we people have here is actually remembering to do all of these uh, extra injections when they haven't. Works really well where people have um, programmed drafting gates. So here they, they give their shot of, of GNRH this day and put in their cedar or their prid. They set up their, their uh, diversion, I suppose, for the, um, the next couple of days then when, they, when they're due to happen. So even if they forget that it's to happen, they come out of the parlor following milking and there are cows waiting in, in a waiting area to be dealt with. Whereas if people don't have that facility, I suppose you have to be using reminders in your phone or something that's going to trigger you to remember that you have to pull them out of the group of cows on this morning to give that PG shot they have to be pulled out again the second day. I think it's not so bad once we get into this area here because obviously we're in a, in a, a routine. They come out, once they come out on this day, we know that they have to come out again this day and they're also going to be out the day after and then being served the following day. Um, so, but it's, it's this, this seven day window of the cedar from the GNRH shot through to the cedar that uh, throws in that risk of getting it wrong. The people forget that this is the point. They start coming in a little bit too late and it does impact on the performance of the programs. So it's important that people lay out the schedule. And as I said, reminders on the phone, I think is probably the way to go for people that they, the night before that their co those cows have to be taken out or on the morning, early in the morning when the cows are coming in, that you just remind yourself that there are cows to be pulled out for, for that program. So um, that's, there, there are those, there's just one question, how soon after service would you scan the heifers for pregnancy, thinking of moving any that didn't hold into milking hard for easier heat detection and service? 
So yeah, I suppose Alan, they generally you can scan from kind of 30 days, 35 days on. Um, I suppose if you've identified that they're not in calf, you could actually put them on a, uh, you could in, just inject them potentially to bring them bowling if you didn't want. Uh, some people do run them with the milking herd. I suppose it creates a bit of uh, extra fuss within the parlor if uh, in collecting yard is under pressure maybe in some cases, that adding extra stock to it isn't a great idea. Um, but they do tend to stay back from what I hear people saying that they don't try to come into the parlor, so they actually leave themselves behind in the back of the collecting yard. Um, so it can work, I suppose, from heat detection, obviously, because you have a greater level of, of estrus activity happening in the herd. Uh, so it, it does uh, work from that point of view that they will be helped to be picked up. So, yeah, you can scan from uh, kind of roughly 30 days after service uh, and you should be able to identify whether they're in calf or not at that stage. So I suppose, look, uh, it's just half 10. I said I'd do a short one today. I've another group there shortly as well. So um, we'll leave it at that for today and we'll be back next week. I suppose just to summarize on the, the whole protocol. So decide what program you're going to go on with your heifers. Uh, we would be recommending that people synchronize heifers because it does get them calved earlier in the breeding season, which is good for them. And the, um, the synchronization, obviously, as I said, from the point of view of Dan's, Cell count of work would suggest that it's a positive from that point of view as well. Uh, and from a labor management point of view, look, I think the, the, the fixed time AI program does offer people, even though they're, you're, you are bringing in stock and giving different injections and so forth, but again, you're doing it on your own time or you, your, your own, you know when you're starting, uh, you know when you have to do these things. So you're, there's a bit of planning around it, whereas you're, you're going to have with, with the PG, you're depending on heifers to be bowling uh, throughout those first seven days. Um, you have to be available to AI them then for that period, etc. So there, there can be labor-saving benefits to the whole um, fixed-time AI protocol with the heifers. Now, there is a cost associated with it, but look, people need to make those decisions for themselves as to whether it works for them or not. Um, I suppose in terms of the, the fixed-time AI programs then for the cows, I think, again, for the sex semen, that's definitely something that people need to look at in terms of trying to get those cows that you've identified for sex semen served with it as, as early as possible, ideally in the first day of the breeding season, so that if they do slip or if they don't go and calf to that, to that service, that they have the opportunity of getting another dairy straw in uh, within three weeks um, and that there isn't a significant slippage occurring as a result of it. Um, there's just one final question after coming in. Best number of days of program. What is the best number of days program for heifers? Yeah, there's a there's there's a couple of different ones. This is a six day program here for the heifers, and that's one that works kind of well and pretty well enough. It's kind of a six day breed program or cedar program, so you can see minus eight to minus two. Uh, what we're showing here, Tom, I suppose, is what we're generally recommending. So that's a kind of an, an eight day program in total. Uh, as you can see for the cows, it's a slightly longer one, um, going out to 10 days. So the eight day one works quite well for heifers um, and the 10 day one is the one that's recommended for the cows. So um, we, oh, there's another question after coming in. Uh, is there a problem with repeats for cleaning up bull after sinking heifers, i.e. repeats on the same day? Very good point, Kevin, and actually reminded me of, of something there as well. So I suppose, the, with the heifer AI, if you're going on the, on the timed uh, protocol, it's very, very important that you make contact with the AI technician and tell him what your plan is, because if you're normally serving 20, 30 heifers over the course of three weeks, it's not a major pressure for him. I suppose he comes at whatever time he's coming at normally and serves the heifers. He's only got one or two to do. If you go down the fixed time AI route, he could have 20 heifers to do in one day. And if... For example, he has 20 heifers to do for you today and 20 heifers to do for your neighbor as well today and another 20 for the other neighbor and another 20 for the other neighbor. He's going to be under extreme pressure in terms of time and just the physical pressure of, of delivering that service on the day. So try to link up with them and plan it in such a way that, okay, it might mean that you're moving a day or two one way or the other in order to facilitate him, but it means that it's it's work going to work better for everybody concerned okay so don't head off down the route of synchronizing a bunch of heifers and ringing him the day before to tell him that they're all synchronized and that you have a number of heifers that need to be served 
um, the following day. Uh, so Kevin's point in, in relation to the bull is, same, is the same as the technician in reality. So the bull is obviously going to come under a lot of pressure if he is expected to serve a lot of, or any number of repeats. So with heifers, I suppose, as I said, uh, we'll, we'll just say 70% conception rate will be expected in heifers. If you're using the sixth, obviously, we're probably going to be closer to 60. So that means that there could be anything up to 40% of the heifers are heading in that direction to repeat. And uh, now again, similar to the fact that they won't calve all, all on the same day with the synchronization, they won't all come bulling on the same day. But again, there probably is a tendency that young bulls are what's run with heifers. So they wouldn't want to have a lot of activity to, to be dealing with in a very short space of time because they may not be capable of dealing with it. So what would be recommended is that, and I suppose it gives the opportunity to get a secondary straw in potentially, is to take out the bull for those couple of days for, um, when you know the, the, the repeats are coming. Actually heat detect for those days and use um, service AI service technician again at that point um, and that will reduce the pressure on the bull and then he'll obviously have to pick up the, the repeats in the next three weeks again potentially at that stage but there will be a lot lot less of them there at that stage they're going to be down into small numbers at that point and he will be capable of handling those um, so I suppose the one thing that has to be pointed out with bulls is that they're capable of putting cows and calves but they can put a lot of cows and calves in a short space of time unless there's a lot of bulls running with them so that's uh, an important point to note okay so uh, I think um, We'll leave it at that, so um, we'll be back again next week. So in the meantime, take care, have a good week, and mind yourselves, and thanks for tuning in this morning.